I'm going to read a um, Financial Times article with you. Uh, I will make some comments as well. Uh, this is published on the uh, April the 4th, 2020, and I will let the computer read out the article itself, and then I will comment on it. The article itself can be roughly divided into two parts. The first part is about uh, the COVID-19 in general, and the second part deals mostly with how the COVID-19 impact on Indians' life. I will be only concentrating on the first part. Now, let's my sister computer read out the first paragraph. You can use the term gone viral now without shuddering a little. You can look at anything anymore. A door handle, a cardboard carton, a bag of vegetables, without imagining it swarming with those unseeable, undead, unliving blobs dotted with suction pads waiting to fasten them. Yes. The virus itself spread more than just illness and sickness. It also spread panics and sometimes well required uh, attention to details, attention to health habits and attention to how you manage your everyday life. Selves onto our lungs, you can think of kissing a stranger jumping onto a bus or sending their child to school without feeling real fear. You can think of ordinary pleasure and not assess its risk. Who among us is not a quack epidemiologist, virologist, statistician and prophet? Which scientist or doctor is not secretly praying for a miracle? Which priest is not, secretly, at least, submitting to science? Even our social behavior may have to be changed in light of the spread of virus. Maybe from now on, we cannot shake hands anymore. We cannot kiss anymore. But we can still say hello to everybody from a distance. It is all about something coming from your heart rather than from your gesture. So as long as you are friendly, there's nothing stopping you from saying hello without shaking hand. And even while the virus proliferates, who could not be thrilled by the swell of bird song in city SE, peak house dancing at traffic crossings and the silence in the skies? The world after this ferocious uh, virus, uh, which spread, spread with unprecedented uh, speed, will change every aspect of our life. Of course, after that, we will be looking forward to a better future. But will that be the case? Is this virus an equalizer between the wealth, the wealthy and the poor? Or will it be an amplifier between the inequities among different groups of people? Let's see. The number of cases worldwide this week trapped over a million. More than 50,000 people have died already. Projections suggest that number will swell to hundreds of thousands, perhaps more. The virus has moved freely along the pathways of trade and international capital, and the terrible illness it has brought in its wake has locked humans down in their countries, their city as he and their homes. The virus not only... Uh, spread along trade routes and lock people into their own homes. It also will have a tremendous impact on the nature of work from now on. If you can work from home, then probably you will work from home from now on. The change that bring forward by this virus will be tremendous. At the moment, as the world economy is being stopped, the impact, how large that will be, remains to be seen. But unlike the flow of capital, this virus seeks proliferation, not profit, and has, therefore, inadvertently, to some extent, reversed the direction of the flow. It has marked immigration controls 
biometrics, digital surveillance and every other kind of data analytics, and struck hardest, thus far, in the richest, most powerful nations of the world, bringing the engine of capitalism to a juddering halt, temporarily perhaps, but at least long enough for us to examine its parts, make an assessment and decide whether we want to help fix it, or look for a better engine. It's so ironic. The virus strike the fears among the most powerful nation. Maybe we should reconsider what does it mean by being a powerful country. A powerful country should be able to protect its own people from human-caused disasters as well as nature-caused disasters. How well prepared are these powerful nations are, it remains to be seen. The mandarins who are managing this pandemic are fond of speaking of war. They don't even use war as a metaphor, they use it literally. But if it really were the war, then who would be better prepared than the US, if it were not masks and gloves that its frontline soldiers needed, but guns, smart bombs, bunker busters, submarines, fighter jets and nuclear bombs, would there be a shortage? Yes, the country which has not fight a war in the last 40 years, treat this virus as an enemy and fight it with all its might. And in about two months, the virus is now under control. And let's look at what a country which has been fighting a war all the time and is well prepared for a war behaves under this condition. Night after night, from halfway across the world, some of us watch the New York governor's press briefings with a fascination that is hard to explain. We follow the statistics and hear the stories of overwhelmed hospitals in the US, of underpaid, overworked nurses having to make masks out of garbage pin liners and old raincoats, risking everything to bring succor to the sick about states being forced to bid against each other for ventilators, about doctors' dilemmas over which patient should get one and which left to die, and we think to ourselves, my God, this is America. A country which is well prepared for war isn't well prepared to handle a virus. Why? I have always been... Um, suggesting that elected government is not the same as good government. We need to re-examine our priorities, our criteria of what is a good government, what functions we expect from our government, and what can we do to make sure the government delivers what we want. Election, obviously, isn't. We have been we have seen over and over over in in the world today so many so called democratic countries failed to protect their own people against the virus. Whereas an authoritarian country like China is able to mobilize as well as fight this virus with the intensity unseen of in the world. What is the future of our world? Are we going to follow this capitalist, free market, elected government path? Or should we now start to consider alternate form of government? I'm not suggesting that the, govern the form of government from China is a model to be copied. But we at least need to re-examine our current system, our current political system. Is that serving our needs? Is that serving our people? Is that only serving for the rich? Although this virus hits the poor and the rich, including uh, Prince Charles, but the results 
of the virus might be very different. The rich can afford the best medical help, whereas the poor might not be even able to see a doctor. Is that an inequality amplifier or is that a equalizer? We need to think and now we are all stuck at home. We have plenty of time. We can start reading some books and then start thinking what the future should be and how we can advocate for a form of government which will meet our needs rather than the needs of a small minority special interest groups. Hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.